Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Airspace Conference and Trade Show outside Washington, D.C. and National Harbor, Maryland, where our coverage is sponsored by Finn Cantieri, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And we're honored to have with us the Requirements Chief for the United States Navy, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Bill Murs. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Vagam. Good to be here. Um, uh, great, great to have you. Uh, a, a fascinating time as the Navy uh, is dealing with great power threats, trying to readjust all of its portfolios, uh, great infusion of money. Uh, the question is spending that money wisely. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Navy is building toward a 355 ship fleet. That remains a priority. At the same time, you're working to get better capabilities fitted onto the fleet whether it's through distributed lethality, whether it's through greater range. Talk to us a little bit about um, how the threat is changing and how that's changing the kind of systems you want on the fleet immediately and how you're going to ramp that into the fleet of the future. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the, you know, the quick summary is we've returned to great power competitions. This has been the theme of the Chief of Naval Operations for the last two years. Uh, Echoed by the, uh, the new Secretary of Defense, now not so new, uh, Secretary Mattis, former General uh, Mattis. And uh, you know all the threats we walked away from in the 90s because they went away are back and there's more of them. Uh, and their pace of, uh, of capability development and fielding, uh, fielding those capabilities is, is also increased. Uh, it's a much more connected world, everybody can see who who's building what and when, a uh, lot of emulation going on out there, and the, uh, the entire uh, circle of life of these capabilities is, is uh, extremely complex. So, you know, we've been very transparent and very forward on some things. We have stopped talking about other things because of, uh, because of that uh, uh, proliferation of information all over. Uh, but the three basic themes are readiness, capability, and capacity, and we, uh, we have to keep those in balance. You know, I have been, uh, been questioned on, you know, what is the priority there? Well, the, the reality is they're all a priority. And we have shown over the last few years, if you let any of those go out of balance, uh, it typically manifests in some significant operational challenges. And we've, we've had a few lately. Um, we're recovering from those, and we're actually on, I think, a, one of the most positive vectors I've seen since I've been in the Navy. You know, regarding the capacity, uh, 355 uh, is the number, but it's important to understand it's a derived number. It's not the 355, it's all the pieces that make up that 355, and we have to have the right ships and the right numbers at the right time uh, to achieve the lethality and the effect that that, that 355 represents. So it's, uh, uh, it's a goal. Uh, we're on track, and I will tell you our priority this year is with congressional help, which uh, we're very appreciative of this year, as you mentioned, the influx of money. Uh, absolutely critical to get the resourcing right to get on the trajectory to get to that uh, larger Navy that we need. What are some of the capabilities, though, Chinese or Russian or other, that shape in your mind as you look at crafting and shaping these requirements? Because your obligation is not just for individual requirements for platforms, but also the integration of all those platforms across the force to make sure that you're getting that overall uh, capability for the force. Talk to us a little bit about what are some of the specific things that adversaries are doing that are playing in your mind and saying, hey, look, this is where we and the entire leadership have to have to trim mm -hmm. and sort of move maybe in some different directions, for example, longer range firepower. Yeah. So, uh, you know, specific capabilities that we're developing, we're, we're tending to stay away from now, but the capabilities that are concerning um, with, uh, with some of the, the you know, what are emerging again as the great powers, um, you know, covers the spectrum of uh, high-speed uh, projectiles down to unmanned vehicles. Uh, probably equally as concerning is the proliferation of that, uh, where these navies are operating uh, and the rhetoric behind those navies on, on what their intentions are. So, uh, you know, as a, as a global navy, as a forward presence navy, as we call ourselves an away game navy, uh, we feel very comfortable operating overseas and, and, and far forward. We think we do that better than any, any navy on, on the world. We do it, you know, 365 days a year, 24/7, and we really believe that's a strength for us. So as they as they tend to migrate out, we tend to be there. To, and 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 our objectives are pretty simple: to maintain freedom and navigation of the seas. So when the rhetoric toward, turns towards ownership of you know previously. Uh, previous waterways that are open to uh, the international community, that's when we get concerned. 
Um, let me take you, uh, in, in your current job, I think everybody's got a good recommendation for you. Hey, you know, what you ought to be doing is uh, this, that, or the other thing. Uh, and Congress has gotten involved in this game. Uh, hey, you know, consider lighter carriers, yeah. smaller carriers. Uh, almost everybody has a recommendation on, well, you know, trade off on survivability in order to be able to get more, more hulls out there. What is the process, what is the rigorous intellectual processes that you're using to take some great ideas, some great recommendations, not every idea is a bad idea, but do the right kind of trade-off analysis on it to figure out what does the thing we need need to look like as opposed to, hey, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's let's take a wag on that. So that, that actually comes back to how we derive the, uh, the number 355. Um, <clears throat> it is analytically based. Uh, we start with a strategic direction by the administration, uh, which comes down through the uh, Secretary of Defense, and, uh, and we operate uh, pretty much focused on the one strategy, the national defense strategy. And our plan underneath that, the maritime component of the national defense strategy is the, uh, the Navy the nation needs. And, uh, and, and how do we get to the components of that is generated by the combatant commanders. Uh, they build the war plans. Uh, those matriculate down into a series of assessments. Uh, then we red te team those assessments. Uh, and then we'll get an outside look on those assessments. And uh, and we did that with this uh, this particular number, and uh, and there were several uh, opinions and recommendations on how big the Navy should be, but they all hovered around 350 ships, and and they were unwavering in that the Navy has to be bigger and it has to include these types of ships to get there. So you know whether it's 355, 400, you know whatever number the assessment says, uh, we we know the types of ships we need, we know the capabilities we need to put on those ships, and we know we don't have enough of them. So we just need to get on track uh, above all else. Um, uh, Congress has uh, recommended, there, there's been a greater debate about aircraft carriers uh, emerging over the last year or so than, there's always been a lingering discussion, but it's been a little bit more pronounced. Uh, Senator McCain, Chairman of the Armed Services, Senator Armed Services Committee weighed in on that in terms of asking the Navy to look at lighter carrier designs. There are other thinkers who are looking at a more distributed force model where many more smaller, slightly smaller carriers may be better. From your standpoint, looking at what the requirement is, at the same time the Navy is looking to get better value out of the carriers that it is buying, given it's going to cost $10 billion to develop another air, a ship, how do, how do you look at that? How are you assessing some of that from a fleet mix standpoint right. um, to ensure that you're on the right side of that and, and don't end up, through congressional direction or otherwise, end up with something that might be good or might not be good. You know, talk, talk to us about the process of thinking that, uh, particularly that kind of a core question, given the carrier is, is the thing around which the entire Navy is organized. So the, uh, the same analytical process also, uh, above all else, validates whether we're right, biting the correct, correct types of ships. Uh, nothing I buy is cheap. Um, nothing I buy is short term. Um, it's gonna be with us for a while, so the elements of uh, adaptability, survivability, relevance, uh, all play very, uh, very big in that equation on determining the exact ship types. Um, you know, we actually embrace these questions we get. You know, you know just despite what some may think, uh, it does. It, it keeps our an analytics honest, and it keeps uh, it keeps a pressure on us to revisit our analytics on a periodic basis. Uh, we look very hard at a smaller carrier option. Uh, we actually feel like we have smaller carriers. We have the LHAs. Um, but the, uh, the speed, the ability to mass the firepower we need to execute our war plans uh, and the survivability uh, keeps coming back to the, the big deck aircraft carrier. And I think we have everybody, uh, at least on our side of the equation, uh, is lined up and in sync with that. And now it's just a matter of what is the most affordable way to buy these, uh, uh, these massive ships of the ocean. And we're going to talk to Tom Moore, so we're going to have an opportunity to, yeah. to drill deep on that. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you uh, a two-part question, uh, given that I think I'm, uh, I'm about to, you're about to get the hook, actually. <laughs> and I'm going, to, I'm going to get across the chin if I don't hurry up. Um, it's, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not drawing on the fact that you're uh, a, an accomplished submariner, but it is an undersea uh, warfare question. Uh, we're building uh, and have derived a requirement for a new frigate whose primary mission is going to be its multi-mission ship, but ASW is very, anti-submarine warfare is very important to it. it. It's a very sort of asymmetric competition we're having with the littoral combat ships in there, uh, as well as other competitors. You know, full disclosure, two of those competitors, uh, Huntington Ingalls and Fincantieri, are, are sponsors of ours. Um, if you look at it, the Russians off of the Syrian coast are using unmanned underwater vehicles. 
new generations of submarines being introduced by both Russians and Chinese, big focus on the undersea realm. As, as you look at requirements for that space, mm -hmm. what's, what's the room for innovative thinking given the complexity of the undersea domain? the opportunities it presents, but the also staggering challenges it presents at a time when, you know, when you started your career, the other guys were louder and noisier, and we always had the acoustic advantage. Whatever was at the bottom of the ocean, we were the only ones who could go there and reliably get it. Now there are folks for 250,000 can get to the bottom of the ocean. Talk to us about that dynamic and how that's shaping the integrated ASW, the undersea focus on that, which includes space, of course, and also air airborne platforms. Well, you, you kind of hit it there on your last sentence. Um, you know, it is getting increasingly complex in all domains, and, and you know, we really hold the undersea world as uh, an area we're very comfortable in operating. Uh, and we're also very comfortable with our, uh, our efforts in, in undersea unmanned vehicles. Uh, you know, we recently announced our family of vehicles that we're, uh, uh, we're producing, and it's a, a spectrum of vehicles largely just based on size and, uh, and the mission sets that we're assigning to them. Uh, you know, undersea warfare is a multi-mission, uh, or it's a, it's a mission for multi-mission platforms. Even the SSN is a multi-mission platform. Uh, we've demonstrated with the DDG-51 that you can actually do uh, very effective ASW with a platform that also uh, contributes to the distributed maritime ops, um, ballistic missile defense, uh, as we uh, collude these capabilities together. Matter of the fact, the, the frigate is a, just an excellent example on our mentality going forward. Um, you know, it's, it's being designed with design margin in it so we can adapt it over, over time. And, and, uh, and I'm not talking to the scale of like the LCS with the modular replacements, uh, but elements of the ship we're going to be able to adjust very quickly. And the whole idea is just to give the commander on the scene, again, a, an away game Navy mentality. He can compose and decompose the force however he needs to, uh, to match the threat. Uh, and that's not in a single domain. That's a multi-dimensional, multi-domain from space to the to the sea floor, including manned and unmanned vehicles. Sir, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Best of luck. Looking yeah. forward to staying yeah, in touch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank <laughs>